everybody. So uh, this is part of the AOS Mind webinar series. Um, I appreciate you uh, tuning in to join us uh, this evening. Uh, we're going to talk about lumbar three column osteotomies and uh, maybe some tips and tricks of, of the trade and how we can do deformity correction uh, on these large cases in, in a safe and reliable way. Uh, my name is Eric Kleinberg. I'm the uh, professor and vice chair at uh, University of California, Davis. Um, I will be moving in uh, in just a few months to uh, the University of Texas in Houston, and I'm joined today. That's what, that's what I look like, in case you guys didn't remember. Uh, I'm joined today by my two outstanding fellows, uh, Keegan Connery, who is an orthopedic fellow here at UC Davis and uh, has taken a, uh, a job in academics uh, back in his home state of Ohio, and then uh, Brandon Ortega. Um, go ahead, Brandon. Wave wave this wave to the people. Uh, who is uh, uh, from USC and is taking a, a pod practice job in Southern California. And so uh, what we're gonna do is uh, talk a little bit about osteotomies. Uh, this is uh, the this is part of the AOSpine webinar series. Uh, there's a kickoff for the new fellows August 15th. Uh, for those of you repeating your year, I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, now, Brandon, that's, that's you, bro. Uh, <laughs> the, there's also a couple other topics that are going to be talking about complications and legal ramifications in spine surgery um, and cervical myelopathy. Certainly, if you guys are interested in continuing to be part of this webinar series, let us know. We'll see if we can't give you those links so you can continue to uh, get your education along with us. Um, in terms of uh, content validation, this is just the medical legal stop. So AO North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty. Uh, dedicated to improving care of patients. It does not endorse or promote the use of any products or commercial entities and equipment uh, that we are discussing or uh, presenting in this uh, case uh, uh, is intended to enhance the learning uh, uh, experience and is not for uh, demonstration teaching. The webinar is going to encompass clinical cases and technical pros regarding indication tips and tricks to safely perform uh, lumbar pedicle tracts and osteotomy. And then we're going to do some cases and some videos that we uh, collected. Uh, using a, um, a, 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 a 3D printed model to help uh, kind of go through some of those uh, different pearls. And at the end of the session, uh, we'd like you to help identify some indications for performing a, a lumbar PSO. Uh, think about uh, outline and plan for osteotomy and then apply some of the tips and tricks that we are gonna present to you here. Certainly there's many others that you've learned throughout the year, but um, uh, this is a nice uh, jumping off point uh, for you in your education. Here's kind of the, the agenda. So I'm going to do the uh, introduction. We'll do some case presentations. Um, then we'll do some procedural videos. And then we'll go back and forth. So actually, uh, Brandon is going to show about half the case. We'll walk through the PSO. And then we'll walk through the conclusion of the case. And, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll try to stop this uh, promptly at, uh, at 9 o'clock. Uh, thank you. Thanks for your participation. I particularly want to thank uh, Brandon Keegan, not just for an outstanding year, but also for uh, helping uh, uh, put together these presentation topics um, and uh, for your participation tonight. I really appreciate it. So, Brandon, with that, I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away and do the case and the case introduction. Um, and again, uh, if I interrupt you or bug you, that's just uh, that's just because I, I love what you're talking about. All right. So, hopefully, you guys can hear me okay. Let me share my screen real quick. All right. So, hopefully, you guys can see my screen okay. <clears throat> so, first, uh, all right, so this is a 81-year-old female with a past surgical history of a L4, L5 post spinal fusion performed at an outside hospital in 2003. She presented with worsening back pain and bilateral extremity radiculopathy uh, over the last uh, two to three years. She was uh, unable to stand upright, secondary pain and fatigue. She's tried conservative management with physical therapy, epidural steroid injections, and a spinal cord stimulator in uh, 2021 with minimal relief. Otherwise, her past medical history was remarkable for hypertension, coronary artery disease, uh, surgical history as stated above, no known drug allergies. She's retired, denies any bad habits. On exam, she was neurovascular intact, bilateral lower extremities with five to five motor sensation intact throughout. Uh, this is her uh, global films, her AP and lateral radiographs. Here we can see the uh, previous uh, L4, L5 poster spinal fusion uh, with uh, antibody grafts and the, uh, at that level, and then a spinal cord stimulator uh, that we can also see. Uh, we can also see that she has a significant coronal and sagittal uh, imbalance. On the uh, regional films, 
Uh, we can better see that coronal sagittal imbalance uh, on the AP. We see that she has a large uh, thoracolumbar curve as well as lateral asthesis of uh, L2, L3. And on the lateral, we can see that she has lots of her lumbar lordosis, uh, both from L4 to S1 and overall from L1 uh, to the pelvis. These are her, um, all her measurements on, uh, I don't know if it's easy to see or not, but uh, uh, we can see those uh, measurements of her lost her lumbar lordosis. I think from L4 to S1, it's 20 degrees. Overall, about 9 degrees. Her PI is uh, measured at 38, and her SVA is uh, about 40. <clears throat> just, just a couple, just to add a little color to this too, Brandon. You know, um, uh, she also has a high pelvic tilt, so you can see how flat her sacrum is. So she's really retroverting her pelvis to stand upright. And even though you don't see a high SVA here, this is someone who has a significant sagittal plane deformity as well. And sometimes you can take those images and rotate them to get that pelvic tilt down to normal to help better identify uh, that compensation. And she's compensating with hip extension, hyperlordosis, uh, uh, hyperkyphosis, hypokyphosis of her thoracic spine um, uh, to get herself lined up in the right location. And, and then, uh, Brandon, how do you think through this case? Do you, do you have a sense about um, uh, what are the what are the parameters you 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 showed all those parameters are hard to understand totally, but uh, which ones matter to you? Which ones do you want to get right? Right. So the biggest thing that we are looking for is restoring her lumbar lordosis. Um, she's about twenty degrees from L four to S one. Typically, uh, the, what we talk about is that number should be around 35, 30 to thirty five. Um, the next thing is she's got that previous hardware. Wait. So, so, Brandon, just to explore that a little bit. So, it, it, what do you mean? It needs to be 35 for everybody? Uh, no, it's uh, also 35 is the number we talk about only because that's where you want the majority of your doses from L4 to S1. Um, and typically, that's what we kind of try to shoot for when we're down in that level. Um, only because if you don't restore that lordosis and you're trying to get any lordosis throughout the uh, other segments in the lumbar spine, then you kind of distribute that lordosis in the wrong uh, sort of area. Um, and patients don't really tend to do well uh, if you put that lordosis a little bit higher. Yeah, and, and by not doing well, you mean they have increased risk of you know, pseudoarthrosis, rod fracture, rod failure, and then proximal junctional kyphosis. And the, really everybody has, uh, from four to one, has 35 degree, degrees of lordosis. And the rest of then the pelvic incidence mismatch is made up from those upper segments that are that are remaining. And so that's something you can take to the bank. So if you're thinking about trying to figure figure out what sort of correction you want, the answer is you need a correction that gets you 35 degrees down at the bottom. And then uh, and then what you want to do is create a balanced spine uh, up above. And what do you think? Is this going to be an easy day or a hard day, Brandon? It's going to be a single case kind of day. Single, exactly. We're not we're not adding on anything else. Uh, we haven't made dinner plans necessarily and uh, we got a little bit of work ahead of us. All right, perfect. So for this patient, um, I think most of us would agree our plan is uh, surgical. And uh, I think I put on here any additional studies. Mm -hmm. uh, I put on, this is the uh, MRI, <clears throat> which obviously has uh, artifact, but uh, uh, kind of hard to see because of that metal artifact. But essentially... Uh, should be going through the axles here in a second. Uh, we're just looking for any additional areas of compression, uh, most likely at that proximal adjacent segment. Um, but for her, uh, obviously, we understand what we need to do, which is the uh, essentially restoring her lordosis and the deformity correction. Um, how much, Brandon, Brandon, how much of a decompression do you think she needs here? Do you, um, and do you, can you stop short? Can we do a L1 to pelvis, or do we have to include anything? Can we stop at L5? If if you're uh, sorry, if you're only doing a decompression for that procedure, or if you're doing a, a full revision deformity correction yeah, procedure. Well, do you want to just do? Do you think a decompression alone in this in this patient would be appropriate? In this particular patient, no, definitely not. Yeah. Why? Definitely. Because her main problem is her flat back deformity that caused her to have this degenerative spine, essentially. Yeah, and she's unstable, right? I mean, if we start taking away the bone of the back, this is. Just going to get worse and worse and worse. She's got flat back deformity. She's got coronal sagittal imbalance. And if we take away the check range in the back, this is just going to slowly but surely progress to worse, more complicated disease. 
she already has that spinal cord stimulator in her. And so she, she's struggling. And, and, and you can see when you go through those, uh, those coronal sagittal planes, she's got a lot of areas of stenosis. She's got L5S1 foraminal stenosis bilaterally. She's got a significant stenosis above her fusion at the 3-4 level and or 2-3 where we see that lateral asthesis. And then you can also see, we go back to, to the, the parasagittals. Um, I, I'm also impressed with just the amount of disc degeneration she has at multiple levels uh, in her spine. And so you can see she's degenerated all the way up to that T12 level. And so we want to go up above that level to kind of capture things and hold those things in place. And the reason we get the MRI is we want to make sure we're not seeing anything additional. We're not seeing a big disc herniation that we need to go after. We're not seeing stenosis in the thoracic spine. That's perfect. So um, for this patient, uh, just some of the questions that I kind of write down for, for most of these deformity patients, uh, the approach, whether you want to be anterior versus posterior versus front back type procedure, uh, osteotomy, yes or no, if so, what type of osteotomy, uh, whether those can be posterior column osteotomies or if we need to do anything larger like a PSO, uh, what levels, uh, whether or not we're planning on using inner bodies, uh, what the uh, upper instrument vertebra is going to be. Uh, if we're going to stop at the L5 or the pelvis, uh, how many rods, and whether or not uh, we're planning on using navigation, which in our case, the answer is almost always no. Um, <laughs> and so you got I, navigation. Your navigation's me, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, hey, so, uh, Br Brandon, uh, Jens Chapman asked, asked a great question. So do you think this that uh, dorsal spinal column stimulator that she has in place uh, do you think that that is the chicken or the egg? And so uh, she's got this kyphoscoliosis. Do you think that that played any role in potentially making that kyphoscoliosis worse? Uh, it's tough to say. I mean, I think her main problem that started all of this was the uh, the, the fact that she was fused flat at that lower lumbar uh, segment. Um, and then from that standpoint, it's, well, as far as whether or not this you know, gave her some basal, you know, sort of pain control that allowed her to progress this far. It's tough to say. So I, I can't really comment on that. I just know that uh, anytime you see a spinal cord stimulator, it's always kind of a bad news situation that uh, where these patients kind of get to a point where uh, they kind of almost tried everything as uh, we can see here. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a, I think it's a great comment by Jens. You, you know, uh, it's a, uh, I do think there for sure is an association when I agree with you, Brandon, when we see a spinal cord stimulator, uh, we're going to have to do something big because it's a bad deformity. Um, I do think the spinal cord stimulators, like, just like we see sometimes with the neuromuscular kids that get the back off and pumps. I think when they get those pumps and they get those stimulators, the curves do seem to progress. I don't know. It's a great question. I don't know if it is that the curve progressed further because they were less symptomatic because the spinal cord stimulator help some uh, or whether or not actually accelerated the degeneration and um, that kyphoscoliosis. Um, and so it, it's a good question. I'm not sure I have got, a, I've got a definitive answer for it either. Um, uh, but I think it is intriguing. And I, I'm, I, as, uh, as uh, Brandon, as you and Keegan know, and uh, Jens probably knows, I'm not a huge fan of the spinal cord stimulators because, um, but that part of that is my bias, right? I'm a surgeon, I'm a fixer. And so when I see a problem, I want to fix a problem. I think that's how you uh, get rid of things um, and make things better. And, and what do you think? And, you know, for her, this patient in particular, she kind of told us, you know, did we decide what are we going to do about the spinal cord simulator? Would we leave that? Would we take that out? What are your thoughts? Yeah. So uh, with this particular patient, I believe we uh, took it out because uh, it's no longer serving its purpose. And it's basically a nice for infection as well. Uh, and, yeah. and, in the and we at and, and part of it too is, you know, I'll, I'll ask the patients ahead of time. And so if they say, listen, this stimulator is not giving me any relief, it makes getting all the imaging more difficult, then I just go ahead and take it out. And, and usually that's pretty straightforward. You do have to be careful. So this one, I believe, is paddle leads. And so uh, that was made with an incision and then uh, uh, placed in, in and around the spinal cord. And so it does take a little bit more work. We have to, you have to usually drill a little hemming laminotomy and then deliver that plastic kind of as you pull it out. Um, uh, but uh, they can be moved uh, relatively straightforward. You just need to find that scar tissue, peel it off of the dura, and then go ahead and slide it out. Um, and then, I, it, as you've seen throughout this year, I usually do take out all of this tubing and extra stuff. Uh, part of it is that it really is difficult to 
uh, realign the spine when you have all that stuff in the way. That's number one. And then, uh, so that's a practical consideration. And number two, they, they usually don't need it afterwards. If you do the job and fix things right, um, they very rarely find a need for a spinal cord stimulator or, or a back foot pump or, um, uh, uh, or a pain pump or one of those things, uh, just because usually you can get things corrected properly. All right, good. I think, uh, uh, so Brandon, why don't you, why don't you, uh, do we want to start talking about, uh, uh, the surgical options and then, uh, and then Keegan, maybe you can walk us through your, your, uh, um, it's not saw bones, but your, uh, spine stud and, and show us how we did things. Brandon, any other thoughts about that case about what you want to do or how you're thinking about tackling it? No, yeah, I think we covered all the big things. Uh, I can show our, uh, what we actually planned on surgery map and how uh, what our thought process was, and then compare the pre-op plan versus what we actually did uh, to see how okay. to kind of grade ourselves and see how we did. Perfect. And, and then, you know, I think just just very quickly before Keegan, before you get going, you know, when we talk about indications for three column osteotomies. Uh, if we look across the board, uh, not just my practice, but I think across the United States and probably the world, you know, uh, we used to really, we used to love doing three column osteotomy. We would do it in the virgin unfused spine. Um, and we found that that led to a very high risk of, rate of neurologic complications and pseudoarthrosis. And so uh, we tried very hard not to do this in, uh, in the virgin spines anymore. And really we're doing this in the revision case. So previous fusion, ankylose spine, Spines that uh, really have no mobility, mobility, or in spines we can't get things lined together properly, uh, we need to do additional osteotomies. And so I don't want anyone not listening to this call to think that uh, uh, we're going willy nilly on this. Um, really, this is our last resort. Uh, we use the disc space first. And so we think about T lifts, or we think about A lifts, or we think about T lifts and A lifts, or laterals, or uh, using the inner body space to really gain our correction. Uh, but if we can't get it right and we can't, um, uh, uh, give a problem, we can't get things uh, um, pushed to the right place, then we need to be prepared to do that larger osteotomy. And in this case, we, we uh, you know, we don't necessarily start off saying, hey, listen, 100%, we're going to have to do an osteotomy, but we look and see what we have, what we need to correct, and then go ahead and correct it. And I, I think uh, Jens made a comment. He said that he thinks the, the stimulators create, create a charcoal like neuropathic disease. Uh, and I'd agree, it seems to affect more of the muscular uh, destruction rather than necessarily a, a Charcot spine, at least from what I've seen. Um, but uh, but I agree, I, I think that there are some real problems with uh, placing those stimulators and, and relying on their use. All right, Keegan, I'll let you, I'll, uh, I'll be quiet for a little bit. That's good. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the actual nuts and bolts of doing these osteotomies. You'll have to I know this case is an uh, adult degenerative uh, deformity case, so you have to forgive our models more of a neuromuscular type, but a lot of it will apply, and we can kind of point out some of the little differences as we go through and as they're pertinent here. Um, so in general, in thinking about this, break it down into a few different steps. So obviously, your preoperative planning is incredibly important. Uh, planning out what you're going to do, Brandon will handle that with a little more specifics in his case after this. Uh, exposures, fast detectomies, decompression, uh, implants, flexibility check, your initial correction, doing your actual VCR or PSO in the case of, you know, the more adult situation uh, that he's going to present, and then a final correction. We'll go through each of these. So I think the first thing to consider is that your exposure is going to be very important, and you're going to lose a fair amount of blood during these cases, particularly when you do the osteotomy. Um, but it is our practice to do TXA, both a loading dose as well as an infusion, both in our adult patients and our uh, neuromuscular patients who are doing a VCR on wide exposure is going to be really important. You do not want to create a situation where you're doing the uh, most complex and uh, difficult portion of the procedure and you're worrying about uh, not being able to visualize things well because your exposure was poor. So you need to take that care of that up front. Uh, and keep in mind, whenever you're dealing with these case patients, either in the adult setting where they likely have had a prior surgery, uh, where there may be defects, or in your pediatric patients, if they do have any developmental anomalies that you need to be aware of to not get yourself in trouble during this portion. And then lastly, again, in the revision case in the adults often, maintaining a good soft tissue envelope, uh, particularly if it's a large revision. And then in the pediatric 
patients, whether or not they have uh, skin tissues, contractures, et cetera, from a long-standing deformity. Hey, uh, I'm just so, going to add, can yeah. I add one quick, one quick thing Please. here? You know, a, a lot of this really boils down to uh, communication. And so uh, whenever we are doing an osteotomy, we will uh, do the exposure, we remove all the implants, we then place new implants, we do our decompression. And then before we do the osteotomy, we take a pause. We check in with the anesthesiologist. We see where we are with the blood loss. We see what time of day it is. Um, I use, you know, often I'll make uh, you or myself take a little bit of a break just so we can kind of regroup and uh, and uh, re-go. And so uh, we really need to, you really want to kind of um, uh, make sure that yourself and uh, your team are ready for what's coming next. And so uh, that communication with the anesthesiologist is very helpful. I'll, I'll ask for the attending anesthesiologist to come in there. I really want to have a frank discussion about how we're doing and how things are going and uh, and do we need to continue or uh, do we take a break and come back the, the next day and even though that is rarely the answer um, uh, it's still important to have that bit of communication so thank you yeah absolutely uh, so first piece is again just emphasizing this because it's you know at the beginning of the case everybody just wants to get going on the the more fun stuff, doing your instrumentation, your osteotomies, et cetera, but getting a nice wide exposure laterally, getting out to the edges of the TPs. Dr. Kleinberg called the white line at Kleinberg, kind of that fascial line connecting the lungismus thoracis between those TPs to uh, make sure you are essentially widely enough uh, exposed that you're not going to run into any trouble with visualization. Make every th other part of the case that much easier from your instrumentation to your uh, decompression. Uh, so first things, basic steps, but we just start by taking down uh, spinous processes and interspinous ligaments. This is our model we're working with, so it's a little bit goofy. Obviously, no interspinous ligaments, yet, but take spinous processes down all the way to the base, uh, leaving, obviously, a couple cephalad caudal to maintain that tension band above. And then we perform uh, inferior articular process facetectomies um, at essentially all of the levels we're going to be working at. Typically in these pediatric patients, if we're doing hooks at the top, we'll do a little bit smaller of an osteotomy there. But I've just outlined on this uh, left image, we go essentially from that notch where it meets with the lamina and then come out just underneath the transverse process there through the pars. In our adults, we'll do these with an osteotome. Uh, we will use a, a bone scalpel just to limit the bleeding a little bit in the pediatric patient. Um, but essentially it's just that squared off cut at each level to knock off the IAP. That's going to help us both give us a little additional bone graft as well as improve our visualization for placing our implants. So next stage, this is just an image of what things look like after we've freed things up by doing our facetectomies, taking off our spinous processes and our spinous ligaments, et cetera. So then once that's done, kind of our basic exposure, basic osteotomies that essentially all of these patients are going to get. And now it's time typically for us to start thinking about our implants. Um, so pelvic fixation, how many pelvic bolts are we going to place um, on each side? What are we going to use from that standpoint? And then size and density of the screw. So uh, at how many levels are we actually going to instrument? Where do we want to think about having the most of our screws versus less? Number of rods we're ultimately going to use. And then are these going to be single rods that we're going to use to perform the entire correction? Are we going to use multiple such that we're going to need some kind of rod to rod connectors? We'll go through each of these as we work. So typically for us, we place uh, low iliac bolts for our iliac fixation. So we just go from that starting point where our S1 screw is going to be, just go a little bit lateral and inferior just above the SI joint um, and use that as our starting point. A couple of different, uh, sorry, it's kind of, uh, hopefully it's not covered by the your screen sharing thing for you guys. Uh, uh, different benefits to that, though, this decreases the prominence. That was an issue of uh, the typical or traditional iliac bolts. Uh, it helps with the alignment. These align very well with that S1 screw. <clears throat> and it allows us space if we do need to do additional fixation kind of up that wing. We have more space for secondary iliac bolts uh, on either side as we may need for, for correction or for spanning an osteotomy if we want some supplemental rods. And then just a comment about the iliac bolts. Obviously, yeah. there's a lot of different different options. Uh, there's S2 AI screws. There's a, this low iliac bolt. And there's also traditional iliac bolts. And there's advantages and disadvantages to all of them. Um, and, you know, really, we look at the anatomy and place what we need to place. And so um, the advantage of this low iliac bolt is I don't have to cross the SI joint, uh, which I don't really love doing. 
Um, however, I, we have seen good success with the SDAI screws. Um, a traditional analog bolt is probably my least favorite option, uh, just because it typically requires an offset connector, and then I worry about prominence down the road. So, again, that's just my personal preference. I think uh, you've seen a lot of different ways of placing screws. Um, uh, you know, Keegan and Brandon during your fellowship, and and I suspect all the fellows have also seen lots of different options. And and as you have seen, they can all be successful. Yeah. So typically, once we've placed our pelvic fixation, then it's time to start thinking about the placement of screws. Um, so in general, obviously, we're going to want two or three screws, depending on what hooks we're going to place, et cetera, at the most cephalad portion of the construct uh, bilaterally. And then we'll tend to, to stagger or alternate a little bit um, in the portion where we're not going to require as much uh, of a correction, just a little bit less risk. I, uh, implementing screws at places that don't necessarily need it for us to achieve our correction. And then thinking about in the region that we're going to require the most power from, from the screws, thinking about the fact that in this concavity, we're going to be wanting to I think I have a, we're going to be wanting to pull the spine over to the rod ultimately. And so all of these screws are really going to be stressed uh, in terms of their pull out. And so on this side, we're going to need more versus here where we're going to be essentially pushing down with the rod. Um, which is not really going to be a mode of failure for the screws. So we'll, we'll kind of consider those when we're choosing where to uh, place the, the most of our implants <clears throat> and in preparing for thinking about our ultimate correction. Uh, so after we place our implants, typically in a case like this, we'll then think about just, just rod templating. And as I mentioned before, whether or not you're going to use a single or a, a dual rods. Um, so oftentimes what we'll do for these... Oh, sorry, is we'll think about using two rods, one that connects uh, through the pelvis, uh, up through these lower lumbar screws, so kind of that lumbar pelvic junction, and then an upper rod in the thoracic screws, so that you'll see that in uh, images a few forward, but these will be two separate rods that then we'll be able to use and kind of telescope to get our, our correction as we want. And then after we've done that, before we place any initial rods or do any VCR, it's important to actually understand what you're working with. So this is just with our basic facetectomies, but we will actually press on the spine a little bit and see what exactly we have in terms of flexibility. Um, you can get a good idea, obviously, from these if uh, uh, preoperatively just looking at your CT scans, et cetera, looking for areas of auto fusion or, or in children if you're looking at the way they correct on bending films. But on the table, when you have them uh, completely relaxed, it's a lot easier for you to see exactly what you're going to get before you perform any osteotomy. And so I think this is an, an important step, help you understand how aggressive you're going to need to be um, on the actual day of there. <clears throat> you're pretty strong, Keegan. Yeah, that model's pretty soft. <laughs> but even still, you can see with that flexibility, while yeah. you can push it over, um, there's still no, it doesn't derotate at all. It translates, but doesn't derotate. And so it's, this is still, this is a pretty stiff spine that we're dealing with, a stiff model. Yeah. So then this is that two rod uh, technique that I talked about here. So we'll have one rod that links into our iliac bolt and then down through those lumbar screws and then one additional up here. And I think it's important to note if you all can't see it, but look at the angle that these two rods are initially going to be kind of interacting at. Um, so we can see the curve of the spine, but if you just lay those, that shows you how much you really work you have to do to correct this. And so then what we'll do is take two side-to-side -side connectors, our two little domino connectors, and link up these rods. Um, and after we do that, you can see how far away, there's those side-to-sides up and top, and then you can see how far we still have to move. So the amount of derotation and then also correction of that curve that we're going to have to achieve in order to bring the spine over to those rods. In, in the degenerative spine uh, or in the neuromuscular spine, you, you can go to the next page. It okay. is, uh, what's, what's remarkable is how much of this is, uh, uh, is flexible and how much of this is really a shortening, procedure, uh, shortening problem. And so the ribs kind of settle down on the pelvis, uh, the upper trunk kind of shifts over. And so doing some distraction and, and lengthening the spine really makes a big difference. Now you do have to be careful. You wanna make sure not to over, over distract and over lengthen. Uh, if you do in particular, you have to pay attention to the L5 nerve roots, those seem to be the most sensitive. 
Um, Larry, thank you. I just recently wrote a paper describing uh, greater than a, a centimeter and a half of distraction as being uh, it, having an increased risk of neurologic problems at L5, which um, unfortunately are not monitored terribly well. But I do like this as an initial step to get a little bit of length to allow us to gain some flexibility of the spine. And it, it also gives room for the vertebral bodies to then uh, uh, being uh, 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 derotated and pressed into that space. They need room to get in there. And so uh, that is a, it's a nice adjunctive technique. You can remove this rod and put a final rod at the very end if you want. Uh, in the neuromuscular kids, I'll often leave this dual rod construct um, because it allows us to get our length. And uh, with those uh, double dominoes, uh, it is still very, very rigid. Uh, and so as Dr. Kleinberg said, we will use this to get length. And you can see on this how many of these uh, tulips are not even engaged uh, with the rod yet. So what we'll do is sequentially use these clips or reducers, whatever your particular system you know calls them, and we'll start sequentially reducing the rod to this and then going back and forth and also distracting or getting additional length. And I know this is an osteotomy talk and I haven't gotten to the osteotomy yet, but we will often do this before we actually do uh, the osteotomy. It does a couple things. It lets us see exactly how flexible this is gonna get, how much we're gonna get from that side. It also provides some stability when we're going to be, you know, freeing up the spine significantly from the other side. And it just makes doing the decompression and doing the work a little bit easier as we stretch things and get things apart from one another. So it has a lot of benefits from that standpoint. But we really will, while we're doing this, be working back and forth, uh, distract some to get a little bit of length. As you do that, that tends to move the spine toward the rods a little bit. You use a clip to get that next tool up, pull it over and back and forth. Um, until you've kind of maxed out the amount of correction you're going to get on that side. And you can see on this right image, you know, we still have quite a bit of work to do, but we've corrected things a fair amount relative to where we began already uh, without even doing the osteotomy yet. So I already kind of said all this, but those are some of the benefits of just doing that initial correction before we uh, move on to our osteotomy. And then as Dr. Kleinberg already mentioned, but at this point, we typically take a pause, ask anesthesia, how things are doing, how's the blood pressure, you know. Um, and typically while we're doing this, it's just assessing the situation, looking at how much we've gotten, any little finishing touches of the exposure. Again, you don't want to get in the osteotomy, uh, kind of half engaged. You want to be completely ready to go and not have to be working on that afterwards. So making sure you can visualize everything you're going to need to visualize to do that safely. And once they give you the green light, then it's, then it's go time, essentially. Um, so general steps, we're gonna to need to perform a laminectomy, take down the SAPs, uh, check our nerve roots above and below the pedicle and resect the SAP above and below to really skeletonize the pedicle on each side. Uh, then we'll resect the pedicle to the level of the vertebral body. We'll do our actual resection of the majority of the vertebra, impact that posterior wall, uh, and then start linking up and doing our compression. And then if we have any additional distraction on the other side, we'll close things down. So again, neuromuscular case in this model with significant rotation, uh, but typically we would take a, a cob or some sort of periosteal elevator after we had uh, resected and worked down along the side of the vertebral body to get around the front. We're gonna take down the pedicles on each side, obviously, and then remove the, uh, remove the TP and the pedicles, sorry. Image, it always comes off that nice, just the whole thing in one bite. Uh, and then just work down on the pedicles, take that down to the level of the vertebral body again. One side in this case, again, do rotation a little bit covered by the rods, but we'll work on doing that on each side. Yeah. I, the, the, other, the other piece too, uh, mm -hmm. Keegan, is, uh, you know, while you're doing this, uh, we really don't want to, even though the retractor is in here on this model, you really want to be careful about how much retraction you place in there uh, because it compresses the traversing nerve root that's behind you. And so we will develop that plane, but then remove those retractors. And so make sure you do not leave those retractors. They have those uh, nice spoon retractors that you kind of put in that compress everything. And they give you great visualization, but that you are compressing the nerves while you're just looking around and messing around with stuff. So dissect that plane. Make sure that you can see things safely. Make sure that you have, um, uh, you've got a, a, a good um, uh, area 
and then uh, but also you need to you need to make sure you remove those then afterwards uh, develop a plan and then work immediately take down those pedicles and then we can start working out laterally perfect uh, and, then, and then after we've done that, uh, this model obviously does not have any nerve roots to look at, but typically then we would take, you know, uh, a curved freer or a wood center, whatever you like, and kind of just feel out each of this frame and make sure that you have good freedom, no soft tissue tethers, venous structures, et cetera, around those nerve roots that while you're going to do any uh, amount of retraction, you're not going to be tethered by there. Um, and then get good control of bleeding all around that pedicle and vertebral body with uh, bipolar cautery. And again, a lot of this is making sure that you have excellent visualization before you get into the more complex portion of these steps. So, an, an, an additional uh, trick that you can use is uh, if you if you uh, make a pedicle probe uh, site into the vertebral body, uh, you can actually take gel foam and then place gel foam into the vertebral body. Sometimes that can also be helpful to decrease the bleeding that occurs there. Again, just kind of a nice trick if you're getting a lot of cancellous bleeding uh, from that vertebral body while you're opening things up and decompressing things. Nice. Uh, so next steps here, got rid of the video because this model is goofy, but just get to me uh, above and below. We're gonna be taking a, a full body here. So you can just see us, obviously we're gonna be removing that on either side of that vertebral body. Typically, we would just do this, you know, with a nice pituitary rondure, but really free things up. And then there's, here's an image of us having completed a complete discectomy, essentially below, above and below this vertebral body. And then it's essentially time to start our VCR. You can see on uh, one side of the screen here, uh, we've taken a, a pedicle probe and gone into the pedicle in the concavity to help stabilize the body. So we're working against it now that we've freed it up. And then with a the combination of osteotones, uh, kerosene, some people will do this with a drill to decancellate the vertebral body. Then we start really freeing things up and removing uh, all of that bone from the inside. So here's us just using that right angle osteotone uh, to, again, complete a little bit more of the osteotomy here and free up some more of that bone so that we're able to create a nice free segment. And obviously we wouldn't really do this in the uh, case of real patient, but just illustrating how much freedom that has gotten in that vertebral body um, after we had decancellated the majority of it. And then, and then based on how much you need to take, we can remove that entire vertebral body if we need to. Um, we can also just remove the, uh, the decancellated like, uh, like we did in this case, uh, mm -hmm. giving it flexibility and then allowing us to kind of tuck it in underneath, uh, allowing bone to bone healing, uh, which is which is nice and advantageous because now we don't need to put a cage in there. We don't need to remove every last bit of the uh, of the vertebral body and uh, potentially a little bit safer and, and maybe a little bit higher union rates. Then uh, once we've done that, we're happy with the amount that we've taken out and the flexibility that we've created. Then it's time to link up our rods on the convex side here. And so we actually use pretty similar construct, uh, not all the time, but some of the time in these cases with those two domino connectors. What we'll do is again, link up below into the pelvis and the lumbar screws. And then we'll sequentially, those are just the example of those two rods that are gonna telescope through those domino connectors. And then we'll sequentially do the same thing, use those clips, but this time we're gonna be gradually deep or gradually compressing in order to close that osteotomy site and get the last amount of our correction here. So as we do this, you can see that Brandon's kind of holding this rod holder. Um, it's very nice when we have an additional resident or somebody here to help us because sometimes this does take three sets of hands. But what's happening is these two rods can bind within the domino connectors as you're trying to get this correction since you're linked on both. So we're kind of applying pressure in the way that we want to get this correction to keep this from binding. And then at the same time, we're compressing to close that osteotomy. So that's an image of the final construct. Again, on one side, we've done a fair bit of distraction. On the other, we've done a good bit of compression in order to close our osteotomy and get our correction. And there's just a side-by-side -side image of uh, before and after our osteotomy and uh, manipulation with our screws. And I think the big take-home messages are just have a good plan in place before going to the operating room, get yourself good exposure. Sequential correction is very helpful. 
And then again, don't forget to make sure that the anesthesia team is uh, on board with everything as you're doing it. Make sure that the, the patient is as teed up as possible. As Dr. Kleinberg said, nobody wants to come back and finish something up another day or, or accept less of a correction because the patient's not doing well, but uh, it's obviously a very important consideration that we can't forget about. And the, this uh, double and domino, so, yeah. yeah, no, we'll, we'll go back to Brandon and look at the case. This this double domino uh, connection is really helpful for the neuromuscular cases. Again, it just allows really nice lengthening in the concavity and then compressing the convexity to get things uh, lined together properly and, uh, and uh, uh, get things uh, out to length appropriately. Um, it also allows you to control both the coronal plane and the sagittal plane in one bit. Um, and that is nice. So you can compress or distract or do whatever you need to do to get things lined up together properly. Uh, when you're doing a, a lumbar PSO, uh, like Brandon's going to show, but really the first thing we're going to do is we're going to lengthen the spine. Uh, then we place, then we uh, achieve our lordosis at from four to one first, lock that in place. Uh, and then we start building to that upper bit of the spine. So it's really getting lordosis down low first um, and then start talking about building to the upper segments. Go ahead, Brandon. Myself. Okay. You're, you're uh, muted. You guys, yeah, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Uh, all right, so back to our case. Um, all right, so let me just show you guys what we actually planned out. And so this is our pre-op uh, images versus our actual plan. And so here I, uh, we planned out for a, uh, a L4 PSO. Um, and I believe it was, uh, I measured it at 25 degrees, um, which was just a conservative uh, kind of uh, osteotomy that we made for this particular patient. And we can see here that we restored her uh, sagittal uh, balance. And I think the overall lordosis doses was measured at 42 um, with a four to one uh, lordosis that was uh, 43, but uh, sometimes it's kind of finicky uh, using surgeon map to to get your overall uh, angles for uh, these osteotomies and it changes a little bit but uh we just, we'll see on the finals how uh, everything lined up um and, it, it, and then and then we obviously also put an l5s1 uh, t lift and so we don't get all our correction necessarily through that osteotomy we're using that open disc space the fiber and disc space is open so we're going to take advantage of it and we can put in a 10 or 15 degrees of lordosis through that segment and then get the last bit that we need through the PSO site. And the PSO is not just done for the sagittal alignment, but also for that coronal plane uh, alignment to get things slid back over into the right place. So uh, here are the uh, floor images. We can just kind of go over uh, some of the steps that Keegan already uh, went over briefly. So we removed the instrumentation at uh, L405. We removed the uh, spinal cord stimulator. We instrumented uh, T10 pelvis skipping L4 placed uh, bilateral bolts, uh, two on each side. We decompressed L1 to L4. Then we did the revision decompression at 4.5. We placed the 5.1 T-lift uh, with 13 millimeter cage. Um, and then we were ready to do our L4 PSO. And so we uh, were able to take intraoperative floral images that demonstrated about uh, 34 degrees of overall uh, lumbar lordosis. We decided to convert our PSO to an extended PSO with the uh, assistance of a cage to help serve as a fulcrum to help give us an additional uh, lever to help give us that lordosis that we want at that L4 to S1. And uh, <coughs> sorry, we took some. Um, this is uh, 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 the image of uh, of that construct when we decided to do that. Uh, use that uh, inner body cage to help serve as that fulcrum, and you can see here how we got. Um, some good correction on the uh, praxis table. Um, we use the uh, intraoperative scoliosis uh, x-rays to help um, assess our overall alignment intraoperatively. And we can see here that we have uh, were able to restore her uh, overall coronal and um, sagittal alignment uh, in, in the uh, intraoperatively without the use of those uh, accessory rods uh, at this point. And uh, this is a picture of our, um, sorry, one sec. This is the uh, intraoperative uh, radiograms, once again, demonstrating uh, restoration hey, of, yeah. Will you go back back to this one picture? So this yeah. is uh, uh, the T-bar. This is a nice technique to look at the overall alignment. 
And what we can do is we can drop a, uh, you can, it's a, uh, a, every company has it. It's essentially just a T-lock uh, that locks the, these uh, two uh, uh, rods in place. And what you do is you place it at a fixed place. It doesn't matter where in the pelvis you want to put it. There's tab on that's fine. Or if you want to put it at the notch, uh, but you want to place it someplace reliably down on the pelvis. You can see things nicely. And then what you do is you, you place a, a rod up top uh, that then gets lengthened. And so that you can then assess where it falls in place. And what really what you want to do is uh, look where it's falling up in the, that upper thoracic spine. So uh, C7, T1, T2. And you're going to ignore some of the stuff in the middle because you don't want to get distracted by um, uh, s some of that other uh, upper thoracic deformity. You really want to focus uh, on getting the overall balance and that correction appropriate. And you can do this with fluoroscopy. You can also do this with an O-arm. Uh, they can do a nice job of kind of stitching things together. But regardless, you want to make sure you can assess both the coronal and sagittal plane. Make sure that you got things uh, dialed again together nicely. And then, uh, then Brandon, when you go to your next page, and then when you get your, your final intraoperative exercise, then you know you are uh, uh, nearly exactly where you want to be. You, you've gotten things essentially aligned together properly. Uh, you And this is really just for final confirmation uh, that we've, in fact, restored the amount of lordosis that we uh, saw on fluoroscopy and that we've achieved the coronal balance uh, that we hope to. And you can still do some final correction. So we place those final rods and they can be used as kickstand rods to gain a little bit of length or compression. Uh, and then they also uh, serve to give some additional stability around that osteotomy site. You can also, if, if you do a, a larger correction or more aggressive correction, you can also use short rods across there or satellite rods. I think any one of those is, is appropriate. And, we will we'll do that based on what the deformity looks like and the amount of correction necessary. So this is um, her uh, standing uh, radiographs. And then uh, we just keep going through these closer up of those uh, AP lateral views. And then here's her uh, with everything kind of uh, measured out. So we can see on the AP that her uh, C7 plumb line is about uh, 1.2 uh, centimeters from her CSVL. Her uh, thoracic lumbar curve is now about 13 degrees. On the lateral, uh, we see the restoration of her uh, lumbar lordosis, which is now uh, about 33 degrees from L4 to S1, uh, and then 39 degrees from uh, L1 to the uh, to the sacrum uh, with her SVA. Uh, I think it's. Uh, eight millimeters, I think I measured out. Um, but you can see here overall, everything looks well balanced on both the AP and lateral views. Um, and then this is just her pre-op uh, AP compared to her post-operative uh, AP just for comparison. And then on the, uh, similarly for the uh, laterals, we see the pre-op imaging, the plan, and then our actual uh, executed uh, surgery. And so uh, overall, I think we achieved our goals of both uh, restoring her coronal and sagittal balance, as well as uh, decompressing uh, all those nerve roots that were uh, compressed at those fractional curves um, on the lower lumbar spine. So she- yeah, uh, Hey, Brandon, will you go back, um, uh, just go back two more slides, uh, just to the full standing EOS film. Yep, and one more. You know, the one, one reason I love, uh, I, I like the EOS films is it really gives you a sense about her overall compensation. And you can see now she's got restoration of her thoracic kyphosis. So with reciprocal changes, she has no extension through the hips or the knees or the ankles. And so she's all lined together properly, giving you a sense that you've actually achieved what you wanted to. Um, these are really invaluable to get a sense, not just of the spine that you corrected, but also all these other compensatory mechanisms uh, that make such a big deal and allow us uh, to, you know, functionally, this is what's going to affect her the most by having that flexibility and that, 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 uh, and not having that compensation. But this is what's going to allow her to have decreased back pain, decreased energy expenditure, and the rest. And then you can also see that we, we obviously removed her spinal cord stimulator, uh, which she didn't need afterwards. And so just a, just a, another kind of clue that, uh, that maybe you got things into a decent location. So, oh, and then, uh, and then, and then yeah. so, sorry, I, sorry, I keep interrupting. The other thing too that I love, Brandon, that you did here is is uh, if you uh, the old adage, right? If you don't, if you fail to plan, 
then you plan to fail. And so uh, the best way for you to understand what you've done, especially early on in your training, um, and as all the, the fellows, as you go off into your careers, um, if you plan what you did and then look back at your post-operative x-ray and then compare it to your plan to talk, to think then through about what went the way you thought it would, what didn't go the way you thought it would, why was it different? Why is the final alignment different than what you planned on? Um, and that will allow your plans for you to refine your plans and for them to get better and better and better. Um, there's lots of different uh, softwares you can use. You can, uh, you know, in the old days, uh, uh, when I was learning how to do uh, spine surgery with uh, Jens and Carlo and Rick in, in Seattle, you know, we had real x-rays and you could cut them up and tape them together to think about how you were going to do osteotomies. Now we've got this fancy software, but uh, you really have to use it and plan it for you to understand how it works, what you can get and how you're going to get it. And uh, as you all start to go into your own practices, you're going to see some things you can do, uh, you know, you can get massive PSO corrections and the answer is sometimes you can't. Um, and so uh, knowing your own surgical limitations will allow you to do a better job for your patients. And then I'm sorry, Brandon, then please continue. No, thank you. Uh, I was just going to mention how she did post operatively. She did well. She was discharged on a post at day six to a skill nursing facility. She came back for her uh, eight week uh, post operative appointment where her incision was healed. Her radiculopathy had improved and she was ambulating without any assist device. And then she missed her uh, eight week appointment because she was on a, uh, uh, I think she went on a cruise uh, to Greece with her husband. So obviously she was doing very well. Um, overall, great results. Uh, and then I think a lot of the techniques that we learned throughout the year, uh, you know, ended up being used in this particular case. So it was good learning overall. Yeah. So, and so if there's any questions, please go ahead and put it in the Q and A. You know, I think, um, I think the other things that uh, a lot of the nerve root, you know, the things we worry about are going to be neurologic injury, uh, which can, and the difficult part with the neurologic injury for the PSOs is that uh, they're not going to be detected. And so you'll get no normal neurologic signals throughout the surgery. And then while you're compressing things down, you'll get a neuropraxia. And so just be cautious that once you close the osteotomy site, uh, or as you're slowly closing it, you feel behind the dura to make sure that nothing gets entrapped there. Make sure you, uh, in addition to checking the neuromonitoring, actually palpate the nerve roots to see how they feel. They should feel nice and loose and, and relaxed. If they're not, you may have uh, given too much correction, in which case uh, you can place that cage, um, and that can give a little bit of uh, uh, support to those nerves and allow things to sag a little bit less. Uh, you can also revise your decompression and really take down the scar tissue a little bit more laterally, allowing that nerve again to be less tethered. Those things will make a big difference. Um, you will it, it, inevitably you will have you can have neurologic uh, problems with PSOs, um, and it's important to differentiate the the active compression for the neuropraxia. And the classic neuropraxia is going to be painless weakness, and so uh, they'll they'll have some weakness in their EHL. Um, uh, but they will not have any discomfort in it. Those are usually appropriate to watch. Uh, you can get uh, imaging afterwards and make sure that the nerves be compressed appropriately, but those uh, we rarely go back in on. Well, as if you have somebody come in, who, who, a post-operative who has painful neuropathy, painful weakness, that's really something you want to go explore. That's typically going to be active compression in, in the form of a bone spicule or scar tissue that uh, you underappreciated intraoperatively and those are ones you want to quickly return back to the OR. And um, in these cases, when we're doing uh, high grade uh, uh, reductions and complex surgeries, we get neurologic exams uh, in the operating room. It's a, a little bit of torture for uh, the fellows and for the attending and for the uh, anesthesiologist. Um, but it then allows you to uh, uh, easily decide to reopen up the patient to do the right thing. And so if you go to the PACU or you go to the floor to examine them, it's a much bigger deal to bring them back to the OR to uh, to explore them. So again, I would encourage all of you if you're doing these these uh, complex uh, uh, osteotomy surgeries, you know, with high neurologic risk, you really need to examine your patients carefully, uh, both before the surgery and afterwards, um, and immediately afterwards in the operating room is uh, again my preferred method. Um, if I, I don't necessarily do it for every case, if it's not if it's a simple decompression or a simple fusion. I don't necessarily do that, but for these more complicated surgeries, I, you really want to make sure that everything is working properly. It does not look like we've got any questions, so uh, we must have done the perfect job of explaining things. So lots of different ways to, to do this. Uh, be careful with the nerves. Be careful with the traction. 
uh, remove the pedicles first, uh, work within the vertebral body in the confines of the of the vertebral body before you work outside and then really scrutinize your decompression afterwards. All right, good. I, you know what, I, I think uh, if there aren't any questions, I think uh, we'll just go ahead and end this webinar just a little bit early and uh, we'll give you guys uh, uh, back uh, five to 10 minutes of your day. All right, thanks guys. Thanks again, Keegan and Brandon for your uh, help and putting those cases together and uh, the videos and all the rest and for the help this year. All right, guys, have a wonderful yeah. day. Thanks, everybody. Thank okay. you.